Amen. Thank you, Praise. I love the energy that you bring to the room. And just because this is our last chance before we get to Easter, I just want to highlight a couple of things you said. First of all, I want to tell you why the Encounter Self-Guided Prayer experience this week is for everyone in this room. There are really two primary reasons I want to prove it to you right here. The first reason I know it's for everyone in this room is because you have 44 different hours to choose from. Is that okay? Can we get it? Like, just get your calendar right now. This fits really well with what we've been talking about in the Breathing Room series, which is your hour of the 44, Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m., okay? And don't be writing like, oh, Ben, I'm so busy. I need 11 p.m. to midnight. 44 hours. Just figure it out. Go to work late. Come home early. Whatever the case is. But you're not going to want to miss that. That's one reason I'm going to tell you it's for every one of you. The second reason, in case you're nervous about what that might look like, that I can t- show you that it's for every one of you, whether you pray every day, multiple times a day, like you don't even talk to people because you're always praying, if that's you, or you've never really prayed before in your life, it's going to be a self-guided thing, but we're going to guide you at every station. There'll be eight stations. So as soon as this gathering is over today, a team will transform this room. All chairs will be removed, and there'll be about eight different stations set up throughout the room. And as you go to one station and then to the next, there will be instructions there. Reflect on this. Here's a sample prayer. And so, and you're by yourself. You're not praying out loud. And I just want to, and that's what I want to let you know. It's for every one of us. If you've never done that, if you, you know, if it takes you 20 minutes or you're in the process for an hour, it's all good, okay? It's not your own pace. It's an hour of those 44 hours that works for you. And wherever you are spiritually, even if you're like, I'm not even sure I believe all of this, it'll be great just to be able to read over some of the central tenets of our faith, to think about people in your life and people around the world who could use some prayer. And so I think it'll be a great experience. And then, and then Friday... And then Friday, what we're going to do is have our first Good Friday gathering ever. It's going to be different than any service that we do here on a typical Sunday. It will be uh, more somber in nature. We'll enter in silence. Everything, three songs centered around the cross, some scripture reading to open up that service. I will be reflecting on what happened in those last moments of the life of Jesus, his sacrificial death for our sins. We'll receive communion together. And and it will be an opportunity, I think, um, what it will end up doing is making the Sunday Easter experience a, a a more full uh, experience for us. Because what we all want in life um, is victory, right? We all want victory, right? We want to lose 20 pounds but not have to quit eating what we're eating. Yes? We don't want the struggle. We just want the victory. Anybody else besides a pastor who's just like, but there's no victory without struggle. And one of the things we often can forget around Easter is, hey, this isn't just about victory. This is about death preceding the greatest victory ever. And there's no way to get the full weight of Sunday without carrying and experiencing and entering into the weight of Friday. And we spend Saturday waiting with anticipation. And then we gather celebration times 8 30 10 11 30 on easter morning so make plans to be here praise is right there are people who will come to easter who won't attend church any other time of the year some of those people are in your circle and in my circle and let's get those invitations out to them this week but today we're putting to bed the breathing room series and depending on how you've enjoyed or not enjoyed it over the last month and a half or so might depend on whether or not you're excited or a little bit upset this morning. And so I've got to ask this, so I'm a little bit hesitant and nervous to ask it. Um, The principles we've covered, has anyone in the room been able to sort of implement one of them or more in their actual lives? Anybody? Breathing room principles? Just needing to know if I need to resign today, and I think that's close to a yes. It's not easy, right? And I don't know if you're like me. It's like, oh, we're in this breathing room series, and I'm getting more pressure from life than ever before. Anybody else? So I talked to a number of people at the Easter egg hunt yesterday. All had the same boring answer, and I had the same boring answer. How's it going? It's just really, it's really so busy, Ben. I hear you. I hear you. My kids have 43 baseball games in the next 10 weeks. It's Easter. We're dividing and conquering today. Shauna took Sam to his 9 o'clock game. She's going to show up here in the middle of this amazing message. She will show up. Then she's going to lead the team that turns this room around. I'm going to take Asher to South Sunset for his 1.30 game, and then I'm going to take Elijah to Treasure Island for his 4.30 game, okay? I'm with you. There is no breathing room. Like, Ben, your principles are amazing. They just don't work when your schedule's like this. 
So um, I, I hope that it's been helpful. What we've been saying is that breathing room is the space that exists between our load and our limits, what we're carrying and, and what we could potentially, what our capacity is. And, and we've been saying that God has woven into our own DNA, every human's DNA, this need for breathing room, that your life can't operate at maximum capacity without adhering to his plan of breathing room in your life. And that he even built it into the fabric of the universe, the way the world works. A vineyard is, is, is not harvest time forever. Does that make sense? The vineyard needs some, some breathing breathing room. He, he built it into agriculture. He built it into humans. It is everywhere. When you think of why God made day and night, do you know why? To give some breathing room. He didn't know we were going to come up with all this technology stuff, but we could stay awake and work forever. He, he invented breathing room. Do you think about seasons? Breathing room. So it's, it's everywhere you look. And what we've been saying in this series, really three things. Why is breathing room important? How do we create some breathing room in our lives? And what do we do with the breathing room we find? But here's the big idea for today. There will never be enough breathing room in our lives to say yes to every opportunity that comes to us. There will never be enough space, enough breathing room in our lives to say yes to every opportunity that comes to us. And I already know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Ben, I can count at least two or three times over the last 20 years that I've actually said no. I don't always say yes, Ben. I can at least think of a couple of times over the last two decades where I've said no. Well, let me make this a little more explicit for you by telling you the title of the talk for today. Here's the title of the talk for today. It's Few Yeses and Many No's. Few yeses and many no's. I know what you and I want to be true. I've seen how you live. I know how I live. We want to live with many yeses and an occasional no. But if you're going to hone in on what God's created you to do, and you think about the time margin you have in your life, and 24 hours in a day, times seven days a week, times months of the year, times the years that you will be here on earth, You cannot, and I cannot, say yes to most of the things that are presented to us, either in our own minds, from the companies we work for, from other companies, from our family members, at times even from the pastor encouraging you to do something. We can't say yes to everything. Few yeses and many noes. Once we gain clarity around what God's yeses are for us, this also informs to us that most everything else should be a no. Once we gain clarity around what God's yeses are for us, this also clarifies that most everything else should be a no. Clarity is king in my life. I don't know about you. Anybody else? Like, I'm not afraid of putting out hard work. I'm not afraid of doing anything, but it's pointless when I don't have clarity. Anybody else? In fact, my friends and our staff team, they know that um, one of my greatest things that I'm always talking about, whether things are going great or bad, has a lot to do with the clarity. So when I think about my gauges for life, how I'm engaged in what God has for me to do, the three things I'm looking at are my passion, my clarity, and my joy. Where's my passion? Where's my clarity? And where's my joy? But when clarity is there, when God gives us clarity around our yeses, you need to understand that it is also clarifying what the no's will be in your life, and the no's will be practically everything else. And you see this pattern all throughout the scriptures. When you look at the men and women, their stories that you love, we love telling to our kids down the hallway, we love reading for ourselves and being encouraged. All of these stories have this principle throughout it. It's that you can say yes to only so many things. And if you want to get in on God's mission for your life, you must say yes to it. And you must be okay saying no to a bunch of other things. And many of us today... Do you know that we've taught this before, but when the word priority came about, you know it was never intended to be, be plural. Does anybody know that? But some genius along the way was like, oh, we can have more than one of these. It was never intended. It was never intended to be plural. It, it, was, it was always intended to be singular, just as Brad was praying a moment ago. It was always intended to be, what is the priority? And if God's Go, got a mission for us, then we have to be okay with that being the thing and other things being a no during at least that season of life, or maybe that things are put on hold. And so that's what I want to talk about today. There's a man in the scriptures who lived out this principle named Nehemiah. And it's 445 BC when we enter Nehemiah's story. And as we enter Nehemiah's story, we learn that he is a Jew from Jerusalem, but he's currently serving as the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes over in Persia. He's a long way from home. But one day, word comes from his brother Hanani to where he is in Persia, and the, the Hanani says to Nehemiah, our homeland, Jerusalem, is in deep trouble. The city wall around our home is broken down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. So Jerusalem at this time has lost all protection. And Hanani shares this with Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is heartbroken over this. 
He's, he's not just sad, he's actually heartbroken. So much so that he, that he knows God is calling him as this mission, uh, to this mission in this particular season of his life. But one thing Nehemiah learned that you and I need to learn really early on is that if you're going to say yes to the mission God has for you, you will have to be okay saying no to other things. Because you can't rebuild the wall in Jerusalem while simultaneously being a cupbearer to the king in Persia. Tracking with me? You, 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 can, you can send somebody to do one or to do the other, but, but you, can't, you can't be in Jerusalem trying to rebuild the wall for God's people and staying as a cupbearer to the king. And so Nehemiah asked the king for a leave of absence, and the king says yes, which is incredible. The king says yes, and Nehemiah, here are some resources. But we've all lived long enough to know that when God has something for us, there will always be someone who has that against us and doesn't want us to pursue it. Let me show you just one verse on the screen, and then we'll get into our main text in a moment. In Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10, here's where the opposition shows up. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, heard what Nehemiah was going to do, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. In this moment, Nehemiah learned something that you and I need to learn today before we just keep going through the same process. Here's what we need to learn. There will always be people who want to place a no over God's yes for your life. Let me say that again. There will always be people who want to place a no over God's yes for your life. You want to raise your kids that way? That's wrong. You want to go do that with your life? Uh-uh. You want to come seek the welfare of the people of Israel, Nehemiah? We don't want you to. There will always be, always, always, always be people who want to place a no over God's yes for your life. I'll never forget, in the summer of 2010, we moved to San Francisco, but before we moved here, I was a teaching pastor in the Midwest. And when we shared the news that we're moving to San Francisco to start this church that we're sitting in this morning, everyone mostly was encouraging. They were excited. They were praying and thrilled for us to move out here, but not everyone was thrilled about it. I'll never forget in the middle of a particular week where a retired pastor came to see me thought, oh, this is a retired pastor. He's coming in to see me. He's going to tell me how awesome this is. He's going to pray for me. He's going to be encouraged that we're going to plant a church in San Francisco. And this man sat across from my desk and he said, Ben, I think you need to think twice about going to San Francisco to start this church. I was like, all right, tell me more. And he said, do you know why God put the San Andreas fault line out there? <laughs> True story. It's like, no, but this can't be good. He said, because, <laughs> he said, because God's going to judge that city, and if you go, you're going to be there for the big one. So we didn't go to San Francisco. We played it safe in the Midwest. And, and the guy, I think he was well-intended, right? And, and that's the thing. It's not always our enemy like it is for Nehemiah. Sometimes it's people that want the best for us. Sometimes it's the people we call mom or dad or spouse or small group leader. Are you with me? I'll never forget another time. We were at the W Hotel. Some of you know this history, and we believe that God was calling us to move into some permanent space at 543 Howard Street. Man, guys, it was a miracle how it happened, the way the owner, he was going to sell the building, and then he decided to give a lease to the church. He was a very anti-church kind of guy, and, and he gave, was going to give us the space. And I just remember praying circles around that block and felt like God was giving it to us. And it was a big deal at the time. It was going to be a three-year lease, $20,000 a month, which I wish we were paying that now. Um, but back then, that was a huge deal. We were four months old as a church. It was a huge deal moving into that space, making a three-year commitment. We had 107 people. We were averaging that June, four months in, and we made that commitment. But I'll never forget, a couple of friends of mine came to see our space. I just wanted to get a second opinion. What do you guys think? They're church leaders themselves in the Bay Area. And so they walked through our space, and one of them called me a few days later and said, hey, Ben, I just feel like I've got to tell you something. Okay, what is it? He said, I feel like I've got to tell you that you don't need to move forward with this space. He said, I think it would be a terrible mistake for you guys to sign that three-year lease and to move into 543 Howard Street. I had to take a walk. I remember this walk, a walk I had made a bunch of other times, but now it's feeling some weight and angst that I hadn't felt before. And I remember walking around the, the block, around Howard Street, and going, oh, God, am, am I making the biggest mistake of our lives? He was a friend. He wanted the best for us. But I felt like, and we as a team felt like, God had given us clarity around a yes for 543 Howard Street. And if any of you showed up in that space, you know, was it exactly the place we were supposed to be? And we, did we outgrow it at the exact three-year mark? 
which is real easy to say looking back. But at the time, he was trying to place a no, not, not, not ill-intended. He was trying to place a no over what God just was for our lives. So let me ask you this. Is there someone or a group of people who are trying to compel you to say no to God's yes for your life? Ask it again. Is there someone in particular you can think of right now, someone in particular who is trying to compel you, or maybe a group of people you've been trying to compel you to actually say no to what you believe is God's yes for your life? Because oftentimes what we do is like, oh, they're a Christian. They must know what they're talking about. Friends, when God clearly speaks to you, we need a multitude of counsel and advisors and all of that stuff for sure. But when God speaks clearly to you, you need to get in on what he's got for you, no matter what someone else says to you. That's a principle that we've got to, we've got to live out. And, and these guys, they don't quit coming at Nehemiah. So if you will turn to Nehemiah chapter 6 for our main text of the morning. If you need a Bible to follow along, just keep your hands up. The rest of us, Nehemiah, it's about halfway through the Old Testament. Keep your hands up if you need a copy of the scriptures. We'd love to place one in your hands this morning. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. If you find that, would you go ahead and stand with me? And what I want you to be thinking about is, do you have clarity around what God's yeses are for you? And how are you dealing with opportunities or even naysayers who want to derail you or take you off the path that you know God is, has you laser focused on? Nehemiah 6, 1 through 9. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall, so they've done a lot of the work, and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together at Hakafarim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sanballat, for the fifth time now, sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king." And you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear of these reports. So now come and let us take counsel together. And here's Nehemiah in verse 8. Then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my hands. You may be seated. I think you'll see some principles rise to the surface in this text around what we're talking about today with yes to God's mission means saying no to some other things. So these guys are coming after Nehemiah. They are trying to distract him and to deter him. They want him to pack up his building tools and go back home and leave the idea that God had placed deeply on his heart. And Nehemiah's response in verse 3, this is to be a theme verse for us. Frame it somewhere in your bedroom or at your office or your cubicle or your rented desk for the day, whatever it is that you do your work. But look at what Nehemiah says to them. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should I come down to you? Here's what he's saying. I am so honed in on, so laser focused on what God has for me that I can't give you the time of day because I can't be in two places at one time. I can't use the breathing room God has for me to go after his mission and use that same breathing room to go after your distractions and you trying to deter me. I must get focused in on what God has for me. Is there anything that you're saying this over your life right now? The work is too great. I cannot come down. And when we say great work, some of us are like, Ben, I don't know. I don't feel significant. I'm not rebuilding Jerusalem. Ben, I'm not. Here's what I want to say. Friends, the fact that God has a mission for your life, whatever it is, makes it a significant mission. Let me say that again. I don't care what it is. I don't care how private or how public it is. I don't care how small your platform is or how big it is. I don't care if you're leading the entire company or you're the intern in the office. God has a mission for you, and that alone makes it significant, period. 
But is there anything that you know you should be giving your life to, so laser focused, so honed in, so centered around it, that you're able to say, no, 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 my great work is too important. I cannot come down to take care of that opportunity or to defend myself in front of that naysayer. Anyone giving their life to something is significant and so focused with clarity around what God has for you that you're willing to pass up other opportunities that people are going, no, 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 this is the great thing you should do with your life. People are going to continue to come at us just like they continue to come at Nehemiah. Let me tell you guys this. To keep going after God's mission for our lives, we will have to continue saying yes to it and no to everything else. It's not a one-time thing. Anybody realize that? You will be tested. There are days where it's easier to say yes and days where it's harder. Agree? There, there are days where you're saying yes without challenge or temptation or other opportunities. But then there are other days where it's like, I mean, let me tell you guys this, how it works for me. And I'm, I don't think I'm letting on too much, but we might get personal. You know, it's 11 o'clock. I got a busy day. When I'm just rolling along doing what I do here and think about your job, I'm like, man, this is kind of easy. It's a yes. But when the phone rings and someone else has another opportunity, that gets a little more difficult, doesn't it? But it always ends up being helpful because it lets you remember, wait a minute, no, 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 I'm not just floating along here at Epic Church in San Francisco. This is the thing God has for me. So I don't care how big the church is or where the church is located. I know that right now God has me doing this. i am not signed a lifetime contract or anything, okay? I'm not saying that. But this is what God has for me. But there are times that it's easier than other days. Anybody else? There are times where I'm like, God, are you sure? Can we shift the yes over here? Life looks a little easier there. But Nehemiah was so honed in on it. Two weeks ago, I got to be a part of this learning cohort with some mentor pastors and a few, uh, well, they call us younger pastors. But here's the reason I started the cohort this year. Um, you have to be under 40 for the two years, and this is my only chance. So I had to get in now or never. So they call us the next generation cohort, which whatever that means. But they introduced us to some pastors, some guys that I've been reading and have admired from afar a long time. One of those guys is Larry Osborne, pastor of North Coast Church in the San Diego area. And I got to spend some time with Larry this, a couple weeks ago, and he said this that I thought was huge. It just stopped me in my tracks. I wanted to argue with it at first, but then the light bulb came on. Here, here's what he said. He said, we're supposed to fulfill our calling, not our potential. That sounds a little sacrilegious, doesn't it? Because the way I've been doing this with my life is like, no, 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 Ben, you have this potential. You should say yes to this and do that and do this thing over there. And I've been, I've got to apologize to you. I've been leading some of you guys to say yes to things you didn't need to. I'm like, look, you're amazing. You've got 18 skills. Why would you not do that and that and that and that? And then I started thinking, no, 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 this is absolutely true. Think about Jesus. Did Jesus, this is going to sound sacrilegious if you answer it the right way. Did Jesus fulfill all of his potential? Hmm. Didn't Jesus have all the potential in the entire world? Did he fulfill it all? Guys, he bowed out at age 33, not because he had to, but because it was the plan. Jesus didn't begin public ministry until he was how old? 30. Did he fulfill all of his potential? It sounds like you've got to kind of step back, like, uh, Ben, this is unnerving me. It blew my mind. But did he fulfill his calling? You can do a ton of things with your life. A lot of super gifted people in this city, which means we have a lot of super gifted and talented and skillful people in this congregation. And I do want to genuinely apologize if I've tried to encourage you to, to, to fill up all of your potential just because you have potential and you should just, you know, let me just apologize and say, I, I want you guys to go for your calling from God. I don't want us to be a church that does everything we can do. I want us to be a church that does everything we're supposed to do. And I want you in your life. And one of the things that Nehemiah learns that we've got to learn that, that we wish was easier is you can't just say no once. You've got to keep saying no. Look at verse 4. How many times did Nehemiah say they came to him like that? How many? Four. And then we'll get to the fifth one in just a second. But in verse 4, it says four times they came to me in the same way. It's easy to say no maybe the first time, but then, they, then you get a better offer, right? Or an opportunity, like, oh, you got to keep saying no. And so they, 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 they keep coming to him, but look at verse 5. Then they come to him a fifth time, and they change their strategy. Do you know what they do the fifth time? They attack his character, and they begin to spread lies about Nehemiah. 
And Nehemiah holds his ground, and he just says to them a real simple response. He says, guys, what you're saying isn't true. But he didn't ruthlessly go spend hours defending his character. God has been teaching me a profound lesson, and I don't have it down, so just know that. I've been reading with some of the guys I'm investing in, Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster, and we're going to go through that, I think, later this summer. But he has this chapter called The Discipline of Silence. And he says one of the reasons why silence is so hard for so many of us is that we spend time trying to defend and justify ourselves to everyone in the world. And I love what I'm learning from that and then what Nehemiah is showing here. Nehemiah, he couldn't go spend four hours defending his character and pushing the mission forward. Does that make sense? Yet, you know what I do and what you do oftentimes? We try to set everyone straight with who we really are. Anybody? Anybody? I want to defend myself. I want to justify myself. Like, no, 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 I'm really a good dad. Let me tell you all the things I did with my son. I'm really a good pastor. And thankfully, I've got some critics that have been giving me a chance to put this in a place the last month. And you know what I want to do? I want to go, no, 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 you don't understand. Let me tell you who I really am. Let me tell you what you have assumptions about that you're actually wrong about. But you know what I don't have time to do? I don't have time to lead the mission forward and to give everyone the time of day ruthlessly defending my character. You know what I'm saying? Anybody? You want me to dial it back a bit? Listen, when you need to confess to God or others, you confess. When you need to say you're sorry, you say you're sorry. But when you've let your yes be yes and your no be no, and you've said, no, here's the reality, get back on your mission. It's crazy to me that much of my life I've allowed a few naysayers to derail my emotional energy, my mind, my time, and my focus rather than stepping forward into what I knew God had honed in on for me. Anybody else done that with their life? Quit defending yourself. One of the things that was freeing for me as I read this book and even started reading some scripture around this idea is that Jesus and so many other people in scripture, they entrusted themselves to God who judges justly and justifies freely rather than allowing everyone else to be their justifier. Let me say this to you. When you and I get focused around the fact that God justifies us through Christ's sacrifice on the cross, I don't need you or you or that group out there to justify me. Point made. Moving on. All right. I love what Nehemiah does in verse 9. He doesn't pretend like there is no opposition, but he doesn't give a ton of hours to his opposition. Look at what he says in verse 9. He, he recognizes what's happening. And in verse 9, Nehemiah says, They all wanted to frighten us, thinking, thinking his enemies were thinking this, their hands, speaking of Nehemiah and the group's hands, will drop from the work and it will not be done. He recognized who was trying to lead him off the path God had for him. And it's wise, it's wisdom, friends, for you to recognize who or what's trying to lead you off the path God has for you. But then he says this prayer. He's not pretending like it's not hard. He says, oh, God, strengthen our hands. And that prayer is in direct response to God. I'm tempted to not stay focused on what you have for me. And every one of us have that temptation. Sometimes it's greater than at other times. But we need to pray and go, God, strengthen my hands. Give me focus. Like, help me to see what you have for me and let me not worry about everything. Guys, sometimes we need to have blinders on to all the noise and distractions out there and be able to fall fully in love, not only with God, but fully committed to what he has for us. So let me ask you this question. I think it's a really important one. Is there anything that you quit saying no to that caused you to walk away from God's yes for your life? For a while, you're saying no, focused on something that God had for you. Did you, did you quit saying no? Did the temptation become too great? Did the convincing become too strong? Did the paycheck increase become too much that you couldn't say no? And, you know, one of the interesting things I think about all of this is that sometimes there are well-meaning people in our lives who can take us off the vision path God has for us. Have you ever experienced that? It's one thing to know that our enemies want to derail us, but sometimes well-intended friends and family members and even church leaders can take us off the path that God has for us. Let me give you just a few thoughts. Let's say you decide that you want to start giving at an unprecedented level of generosity in your life. And so you meet with your financial advisor, great man, great woman, and they've been your financial advisors for a lot of years. You guys have been working on a plan. But in the 11th year, you show up for the appointment and you're telling them, hey, we believe God's saying a new yes for us is to reach this unprecedented level of generosity. So we want to actually give away five times what we're used to giving away every year. The financial advisor is going to say what? You are you're crazy. 
we have this plan. And the more you keep, the higher percentage I get. You know, and they're going to be well-meaning, but they're going to do everything they can to talk you out of doing that. Let's say that you feel like you're supposed to quit your corporate job and go serve in some foreign country, third world kind of situation for a while. And you have friends at the office, so you share it with a coworker or someone on your team, or you share it with your boss, and they're going to say to you, you, you've, you, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Do you realize that if you go and do that, you're going to be off the career track that God has for your life? And now you've got a dilemma, don't you? Friends, if you think God's mission for your life will always make sense to your closest friends or your enemies, it won't. But the hardest one, right, is when we feel like God has a step for us to take in our lives, and it's the people we call mom or dad or best friend or spouse that try to take us away from that. And this is a very tender conversation. It's one I've been a part of many times. But let me say this as graciously as I can. You do not have enough breathing room to fulfill God's mission for your life and everyone else's, even if they're your parent, even if they're your pastor. With me? But you do have time, and God has given you enough space to fulfill His calling, His calling for your life. The same principle is true in our church. There are thousands of things we could do as Epic Church in the future. Really. And I want us to feel free, keep sharing ideas. But do you know what most uh, of those ideas will be answered with? A few yeses and many noes. And you're like, oh, Ben, why don't we just do all your ideas? I wish you guys knew how many ideas I presented to the team that have never made it to fruition. Probably for the best. But even as a church, guys, we feel like we're pretty honed in in this season for what God has for us. And we want to rally around focusing on those few things. And it isn't that everything else out here is terrible. Now, some of you do have terrible ideas. Like <laughs> car, car show to raise money. Leave an anonymous on all this. Your golf tournament stuff. I'd be a fan of that, except I'm not a golfer. Yeah, I can't share all of them. But most of the time, the answer will be no. Keep sharing the ideas. This is where the yeses come from. God implants it on your heart. It doesn't have to come from the top. It can come from just a person who's sitting in a seat this morning. Like, if this is what God has in store for us, let's run with it. But oftentimes, the answer will have to be no. Because we want to say yes to the things God is clearly telling us to say yes to in this season. A ton of things we could do. This is true in your personal life. It's true in your family. It's true for your company. You just, we just can't say yes to everything. You guys know our old joke around here is that you can't say yes to a gallon of ice cream every day and say yes to looking good in skinny jeans. You've got to make choices. You've got to make choices. As we head into Easter, I just want to finish by talking about how Christ lived out this principle supremely. How Jesus lived out this principle supremely. Jesus knew what his yes was from God. And part of that yes was to come to earth and bring unprecedented levels of grace, right? Unlike the world had ever seen, unlike especially the religious community had ever seen. But the Pharisees and other religious leaders, they wanted to put a no over that yes from Jesus. They could not believe that Jesus would have a meal with sinners. They didn't know they were sinners, but nonetheless. They, they couldn't believe that Jesus would associate with tax collectors and prostitutes. They couldn't believe that Jesus wouldn't throw a stone at a woman caught in the act of adultery. They couldn't believe, couldn't believe that Jesus would associate with such people so much that they started calling him a glutton, meaning he drank, ate, ate too much, and a drunkard, meaning he drank too much. Jesus! They couldn't handle that part of God's yes for him was unprecedented levels and measures of grace. But it wasn't just the enemies of Jesus that tried to put a no over his yes. One of his boys, Peter, tried to do the same. Peter, was he one of the 12 disciples? Easy answers, guys. Was he one of the inner three along with James and John? Did Jesus ever call him Satan? That's never a good term of endearment, by the way. All right? You know, Will and I are talking about lunch during the week, and I'm like, hey, man, we're doing pizza today. He's like, no, we're doing the taqueria. I'm like, get behind me, Satan. We're pizza. But Jesus says it to Peter. Do you know why he says it to Peter? Peter was well-meaning. He loved Jesus. You with me? He loved Jesus. Jesus loved Peter. But Jesus one day talks about the fact that he's going to suffer. And Peter, like we would do if we loved Jesus, perhaps in that moment, Peter tried to talk Jesus out of it. 
Peter tried to place a no over the suffering aspect of Jesus' life. And we know that Jesus in the garden, he would even ask the Father if it could be a no. What he knew was a yes. Could it be a no? But he's like, no, God, it's a yes, so I'm going to do your will. But in that moment with Peter, he says, get behind me, Satan, because I know what my yes is from the Father. This is what I'm about, and this is what I'm going to do. And aren't you forever grateful he did? Because he was laser focused on his yes, it allows us to say yes to life with him forever. Let me show you something from Luke 23 in his last moments on the cross. I think this is the last time that Jesus was ever tempted to place a no over the yes that God had for his life. Luke 23, 35 through 37, as we head, in, as we head into Holy Week, just listen up. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him. That's scoffing at Jesus. Saying, he saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, what? Save yourself. What a moment of temptation. You're separated from your father in heaven. You're bearing the weight of the sin of the world. And they're mocking you, but what they're saying is absolutely true. The scriptures are really, really clear that Jesus could have saved himself, but he could not have saved himself and saved you and you and me. He had such great clarity around his yes. But he endured temptation. He endured beating. He endured mockery. He, he even had to tell Peter, Peter, get behind me. What you're telling me to do would take me off the yes God has for me. And without my death, without me going yes all the way, there will be people that will live separated from me and God forever. So as hard as it is, Jesus goes, no, I will not save myself. I'm not, I'm not coming down. Oh, it's tempting. Oh, it hurts. This is my yes. This is why I came. Have you ever responded yes to Jesus' yes? Knowing that you're part of the mission for which he came? If not, what better day than this day entering Holy Week, this day known as Palm Sunday? Go, wow, Jesus, I couldn't have done what you did. I would have, I would have said no gladly. I would have told Peter, that's a great plan. Let's go somewhere else. So we need to get clarity around that yes, to Jesus' yes, but we also need to get clarity around what his yes is for us. If you're lacking that clarity, let me encourage you to pray for wisdom. James 1.5 says, if you lack wisdom, ask God who gives wisdom generously. But if you have that clarity, let me ask you this. You're, you're, if you're clear around your yes, if we were to look at your calendar, your use of energy, your use of money, your focus, would, would those things align perfectly with what you say your yes is? Or, or do we, as I've had to think through this week, do we need some realignment in our lives? And again, I just want to end this message confessing that I know cognitively what my yes is from God in this season, but I have days where I forget what I'm to be about, and I give myself aimlessly to things that's not for me, at least in this season. And if that's you, just know that grace is available from God, thankfully. But he also wants to realign us back on the path that he has for us. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for your grace. God, it's beyond me that you would even invite us into your mission in the world. That you would use us, not because you have to, but because you want to. You want us to get in on what you are doing. And God... It, for most of us, it's not going to be rebuilding a wall in Jerusalem or some grand public platform. God, for most of us, it's going to be significant simply because it's from you. So if it's raising children, significant. If it's bringing integrity to the workforce, significant. If it is going to serve the less fortunate and poor and underprivileged and under-resourced, super significant. If it is to serve behind the scenes, or in some other capacity here at Epic, God, significant. God, help us to see and hear what you have for us, and give us peace, saying no to everything else. 
Jesus, in your name we pray and thank you for your yes. Amen. Let's stand as the band leads us. Thank <laughs> you.